<clears throat> All right, can everyone hear me? <clears throat> Great. Um, I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm still wearing the jacket. It's freezing in here. I think other people probably recognize that too. Um, so it's great, great. I got about 15 minutes with you. Um, and what I wanted to talk about was uh, day two ops and really what day two ops means in this new cloud native world, and in particular the challenges that people are experiencing as they're moving into the cloud native world um, when it comes to actually operating the things that they're trying to run. Um, so, you know, day two ops, we, sometimes we joke about it back at Mesosphere that there's no such thing as day two ops because. Uh, when you first start to try to deploy some of your software, that's at the zeroth day. By the tenth day, you're way past day two, and you're still trying to get your software deployed. By the hundredth day, you're still you're way past day two. Then and you're still trying to get your software deployed. By the time you actually get it deployed, you decided there's a better technology you're actually going to run, so you start that deployment instead. You never actually get to operate in the first thing that you actually started with. But no, d day two ops definitely exists. So, um, you know, last decades, uh, day two ops challenges. Uh, I think we're something around uh, um, software evolution. I'm going to go through a couple of these just to talk about what I mean when, I, when I'm referring to day two ops. So, you know, last decades, the day two operations looked like this. Developer got their application running, then they went to the ops team and they said, hey, ops, I've got this new library that I started using. Can you get it installed for me? <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. Um, or it's like, hey, ops, I just, uh, in this, the latest version of the service that I'm running, I got a new networking service. Can you open up the port for me? Right? So this is the conversation that was going back and forth between devs and ops. And uh, so lots of great technologies came out to really, really automate this, to make this move faster. So we got technologies like Puppet and Chef, you know, the ideas of infrastructure as code, this idea of dev ops, not just dev, where if you want to do something, you update the code for your infrastructure, and the new libraries will automatically get installed for you via Puppet. Right? Um, um, so more recently, with technologies like Docker, we get this nice software evol evolution because the operators don't even have to care about it. The developers get to own the software evolution themselves. They get to say, all right, you know, I'll install my own libraries and I'll configure my own ports within my Docker container and, and, and the, the ops just don't even care. Now, some op folks, folks out there might say, whoa, 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 especially the security op folks, I don't know how, how good I feel about that. I might want to be in control of what software actually gets installed, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and you know, I think what we're seeing a lot when you, when you look at slides like what Donnie presented earlier this morning from 451, when people are deploying containers out to production, but they're not necessarily using some of the new container orchestration technologies like Mesos, DCOS, Kubernetes, what CNCF is really trying to push, um, is because you're seeing stuff like this. You're seeing people actually use some of these older DevOps-like tools with, with, with containers to, um, to actually, actually run, run their apps. So they're getting some of the best of both worlds, but they're still not there just yet, right? So next iteration, last year's day two, day two, day two ops challenges was all right, failures. So now, you know, we're using the Puppet Docker combination. Um, you know, as a dev, go up to my, my operator and say, hey, these machines just died. Can you get me running on some other machines? Right? Um, or elasticity. I say, you know, hey, I'd like to actually scale up my app. Can you go and provision those machines and, and get them running for me, whatever, whatever I need to do? Um, and this is, where, this is where now technologies like container orchestration, cluster management, are really starting to help with what have been these traditional now day two ops, ops problems, how to deal with failures, how, how to actually deal, deal with the elasticity. So now, again, you're kind of in this DevOps world where you have someone saying, oh, well, I'll just package up my app in a container, and DCOS will be responsible for rescheduling my app when the machines die. Um, and if I need to scale it up, I'll just go use the DCOS CLI, and I'll s s scale my app up. And the same applies to Kubernetes as well, right? Um, and, uh, and you know, I think simultaneously while this was happening, developers also need to say, but I, pr I probably need to change the architecture of my applications. Because I can't just you know, rely on this wonderful magic pixie dust of, of container orchestration to do the right thing, to deal with failures and to do things elastically unless my applications can actually work in, 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 in those environments. So to me, what cloud native actually really means is I've changed my applications to be highly available uh, and fault tolerance. And now they can actually operate in these environments which are not, uh, 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 which are gonna be much more, more dynamic and, and, and controlled in a com completely automated way. Okay, so um, 
this checklist, um, if anyone read, read the abstract of my pre presentation, this is kind of what this talk was going to be about, was the checklist for, for, for day two ops. And I think what's really interesting about this checklist is this is one of the checklists that when I sit down and chat with any, anybody who's thinking about moving into this cloud native world, this is, this is one of the places I often start. Um, and a lot of this checklist actually came out of us deploying uh, uh, the Mesos technology at scale at um, uh, Twitter where we had to run through all these things. And so you know, these are kind of tomorrow's day two ops challenge. These are folks that are adopting container orchestration technologies, um, technologies like Kubernetes, technologies like TCOS. They as an organization need to take their applications and make them operate in these, these you know, with these, 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 these new challenges. So I kind of wanted to talk through them. So first, service discovery. Um, so in the old world, uh, you got to fix your application to an IP and you stuck that IP on a particular machine uh, and that was where uh, everybody could reach that application and DNS worked great because I would resolve the name of, of, the, the, um, uh, of the application and I'd get the IP, I'd connect the IP and I'll be good. In the new world, uh, we might have the application moving all over the place. Um, uh, DNS probably doesn't work because someone's still running Java 6 and uh, Java 6 caches DNS resolutions, so even after you, uh, you know, the thing moves to another machine, we don't re resolve the new IP for, for, for the connection, and we try to connect to the old machine, so that doesn't fail. There's a lot happening in the networking space, but people need to start thinking about what's the best ways to actually solve the service discovery problem. Uh, next is load balancing. Um, uh, you know, maybe in the past it was pretty easy. I just fixed some external load balancers to speak to these particular applications. Um, now those applications are being launched very dynamically. Uh, uh, they might be scaled up and scaled down dynamically. Um, you need to be able to update the load balancers to actually get those load balancers to be able to communicate to the right places. Compounded with the service discovery problem, you have to think about how you actually want to solve that problem. Um, what I think is especially interesting from the load balancing case, and it'll get to some slides I talk a little, about a little bit later, is you also start to have the internal load balancing problem. Um, where as you're breaking up the application into a whole ton of microservices, each of the microservices now want to communicate with one another, and you actually want to load balance each of the individual microservices as they're communicating with each of the other microservices so that you, you, you can sh share, sh share, share the load. Um, networking, so there's a lot to say around, around networking. Um, um, I just kind of wanted to highlight two things. You heard earlier on the panel, a lot of people feel like networking is, is uh, a long ways away for us being able to solve as, a, as an ops challenge in, in uh, container orchestration. Um, I think there's a lot of truth there. I also think that there's been a lot of progress recently. I think we can adopt a lot of the technologies that came out of uh, the infrastructure service realm, uh, th things with OpenStack. Um, but the two big things that really jump out to me that are going to be day two ops challenges for networking, um, number one is going to be uh, um, uh, the logical isolation, who can see who, who can DOS who, who can ping who, uh, um, what a lot of people call segmentation, and then the other one is performance isolation. How many resources can you actually get on the network, both on a single node as well as an aggregate, okay? Storage volumes, another big one, um, uh, uh, kind of speaks for itself, but this is both local storage as well as uh, uh, remote storage. Um, security, what's the right way to do security now? You need to actually um, um, check, check the vulnerabilities, uh, whether or not there's vulnerabilities inside the containers you're trying to run. You need to have some notion of authentication. Who are the people that are trying to actually do things in these environments? It was a lot easier when the ops guys just did everything and the developers just talked to the ops guys because they always had security. They, they, they always had the authentication. They could do what they needed to do. Secrets, so now I can't just install secrets on particular machines. I have to figure out how to get my secrets or my credentials to some arbitrary generic machines. Um, health, uh, now that I might want to move services around, it would be really valuable to, under, especially if I'm doing load balancing, it'd be really valuable to understand um, what the health of these applications are. Uh, metrics, um, what do my metrics look like? How do I collect my metrics, especially as uh, containers are moving all around? Logs, I uh, can't rely on a developer having to SS, be able to SSH in a machine to just read their logs. Uh, that machine might have been completely wiped um, or uh, uh, other jobs might have started running and so we've had to delete the logs to make space uh, and kind of just this general idea of how people actually debug. Uh, can they just SSH in machines and do things or not? Um, um, what's the best thing to actually do there? So, you know, what I think is, is, is great about where we really are as an industry today is, well, for a lot of people that are starting this journey in cloud native, 
um, and in uh, uh, cluster management and container orchestration. A lot of this has been focused on by these technologies. I know I put checks in there, and I'm really calling them yesterday's day two ops challenges. We're not completely done, but we've made a ton of progress, and that's actually really good. So in the same way that there were challenges with just failures with, say, the Puppet and, and, and just Docker world, now we've got container orchestration, we have other problems. The industry is really moving forward and, and, and uh, addressing these problems head on. So um, you know, one of the reasons why at Mesosphere we actually built the data center operating system or DCOS is precisely to address these challenges, to precisely to address all these things that you really need to do when you try to move to a container, uh, sorry, a cloud native world, also a con container native world. Okay, so one just real quick thought I wanted to throw in there. For some of these things, uh, one of the things, I wear many hats, you know, sometimes I'm wearing my uh, Apache Software Foundation hat, um, I, I started the Apache Mesos project and I'm still the PMC chair. Um, so I'm thinking about Apache. Sometimes I'm wearing my CNCF TOC hat. Um, I, I, I'm on the CNCF TOC. Sometimes I'm just wearing my Mesosphere hat. But one of the things that um, I wanted to mention at Cloud Native Day uh, is something that I'm, I'm especially excited about for the CNCF to do is really help to define what is the future POSIX for Cloud Native. Um, we've, we've all kind of thrown out there a bunch of different projects. Oh, we're the POSIX, we're the API, we're the API. Um, I think things like con container native, uh, sorry, c container networking interfaces is a great start to start to define what some of those APIs are. Um, you know, I'd thrown up here container volume interface uh, before I saw Brandon's talk earlier where he had c container storage interface, so that's great. But also things like a container health interface where it would be great if every single container that got deployed, regardless of the system that was actually running it, it could be able to determine the health of, of, of that container in a, in a, in a very deterministic and, and standard way. Okay, so what are gonna be next year's day two ops challenge? And you know, these are things that I think are especially important as people start to get through yesterday's day two ops challenges and are really thinking about how they're trying to run, run their, their, uh, their companies on, on this technology. So a big one for me is, is and, and, and for, for, for me and, and Mesosphere is, is bare metal storage. There are a lot of folks that want to be able to run their applications that require bare metal storage, whether it's for performance or whether because they're, they are the ones that are actually providing the distributed file systems to other people. Okay, so the, the, this, one, this one's really key. Otherwise, it's going to be someone else's problems. We actually have to tackle this. Um, going beyond security, going beyond auth authentication, getting to authorization. Who can see what? Who can do what? This is going to be a huge part of, of, of the day two operations of actually running, running these, these platforms. Resource guarantees. This one is near and dear to my heart. Uh, these these, these uh, pieces of software are absolutely fantastic until you get paged at 2 a.m. because you've run out of resources and the, less, you know, the least priority intern job is taking up all the resources and the high priority job can't get scheduled by the system. This is really, really critical stuff, and it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, we built in from an early day the concepts of quotas and reservations into the, the, the Apache Mesos project. Maintenance, how do you do maintenance? Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, maintenance is kind of planned failures. It's, you know, you're inducing failures, so you'd like to think that as long as your software can, can just deal with failures, since that's what you did, you as a developer change your architecture to make it be highly available and, 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 and fault tolerant. But what if there was a better way to do maintenance? What if there was a way to do maintenance where you didn't have to put the software at extreme risk, where you could do things much, much smarter when it came to actually operating the cluster? Um, Multi-region. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll kind of talk about this one in, in just a sec, but a lot of people are uh, uh, trying to figure out the best way to do this, and it really needs to be addressed with first-class primitives, not with sort of some hacks and some glue being put in places to actually make this work. Um, auto scaling and auto provisioning. Well, now we've got elasticity, which is great. We can just go to our DCOS command line and scale something up, or our cube control and scale something up. But what's actually the right way to scale things up? What are the right metrics we need to pull in to be thinking about scaling up? Maybe the amount of resources you're using is, 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 is not the best metric. Um, and then uh, utilization. And this one's also really, really near, near and dear to my heart. Um, utilization is about actually dry, you know, at the end of the day, one of the big promises that we're making with these technologies is that we will drive up the utilization of your, your underlying infrastructure. Um, but to do that, in many circumstances, we have to do really, really smart things. We can't just rely on, you launched a container that says it's using four CPUs and four, four gigs of RAM. If it's not using those resources, we have to do something smart. These are going to be the day two operations challenges that people start to really, really think about as they roll these out to production in, in, in really serious ways. 
So, whoops, wrong way. So just a couple more slides. Um, you know, security and, and resource guarantees. This, to us at Mesosphere, this sums up a big part of multi-tenancy. When we think about multi-tenancy and what we need to provide for people going forward, this is a really, really big part of it. Okay. Um, one thing I just wanted to throw in there real quick, um, for organizations that are adopting microservices, which is a big part of cloud native, uh, there's gonna be some, some challenges you have to think about as well. Uh, you know, one of the biggest one that we saw at, at Twitter was it's fine when you have microservices that consist of two or three services. You can still Docker compose that on your laptop and actually try to run your entire application right there on your laptop and try things. When you get to 1,000 services, you're not gonna be Docker composing on your laptop to try out how your ap application actually works. You're gonna need to find new ways to actually enable developers to work in these, in these environments when they have thousands of these microservices that are all trying to run, run simultaneously. Then versioning becomes a real issue. Is, is each of the different microservices wanna actually communicate with one another? What's the best way to actually manage all that? Um, and finally, admission control. Now, as I mentioned earlier, with the load balancing, you've got services that are trying to communicate with one another. You might want to rate limit which services can talk to which other services, um, and, and you need to start thinking about the best ways to address that. And if people decide that they want to put in um, uh, message buses uh, to actually help perform some of those functions, then we'll have SOA all over again, which will be totally great. Okay, so uh, a, a couple quick word, word, word of cautions about how, how you might actually want to go about addressing a bunch of these, these, these day two ops. Um, you know, one caution is to be really thoughtful about the short-term hacks that you're actually putting in place. Uh, the example that, that I, I give here is people that are trying to run containers that are using local disks or volumes, something like a database, um, and they want to make sure that that thing gets rescheduled on that box every single time. Uh, we saw this with uh, the DCOS. I'm sure people are doing it with Kubernetes as well. They'll use things like labels or attributes to guarantee that a pod or, or containers always get scheduled on the same machines. But what does that mean? That basically means that you're back to having last year's day two ops challenges all over again, right? So you want to think about that. And there's a big question, which is, should the operator really care about this kind of stuff? Should they care about trying to set labels or any of this kind of stuff to actually make things run? Another one is to be really thoughtful about as you're ro rolling this stuff out to production, the more and more scripts that you start writing to act as the control planes to manage all these containers. Um, this is probably one of the biggest ones that I've seen in a bunch of organizations. You show up and you say, oh, to run this app, we've had to write this control plane that does all this stuff, and everyone's gonna be doing that. Um, you know, those scripts become on the critical path, so you better make sure that they work works super well. And unfortunately, with this model, everybody ends up re-implementing more or less the same script. So when one organization has a bug in their script, somebody else doesn't benefit it because that script wasn't something that everybody could, could actually leverage. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, with uh, the, the DCOS, we actually introduced this concept of DCOS services, which were these top-level control planes, if you will, for running some of these more complicated applications that actually needed, needed to be managed in that way. Um, um, and you know, one of the huge benefits you actually get out of that when you have something like a control plane or, or a DCOS service is you can do things like upgrades, and the service itself can manage that entire thing for, for for you, which is gonna be a day two operations problem that you're gonna to have to do manually yourself, even with, with these environments, if you do, don't have something like that in place. Okay, um, uh, so in closing, uh, you know, hopefully I didn't scare everybody away from, from, from all this. And I, to me, I think the crux is, is that there's still a bunch of day two ops challenges. We as an industry continue to make amazing amount of headway in the right direction, and the juice is definitely worth the squeeze. You know, when you get to the place of being able to actually run and operate your, 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 your companies, your organizations in this way, um, uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be really thankful that you did. So that's all. Thanks so much.